All right, this morning is Pentecost Sunday, and we're going to bring you uh, a Pentecostal message. But I have a story that I want to talk to you about um, before I begin that. So I had a co guy come up to me in, uh, a few weeks ago, and he told me that he couldn't help himself, that he was drinking brake fluid. And I told him, you can't drink brake fluid because that stuff will kill you. And he told me, don't worry about it. I can stop whenever I want. <laughs> you had to think that through, didn't you? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day, and we just ask that you would continue to be with us. Anoint my lips as I preach the word, and anoint our ears that we would receive what we need to hear today. And we rejoice as we celebrate Pentecost today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I want to take you to the book of Joel, chapter 2. That's a surprising passage, isn't it, for Pentecost Sunday? Joel chapter 2, in verse 28, and here's what it says. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my men servants and my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. So on this day, almost 2,000 years ago, there were 120 followers of Jesus who were simply doing what Jesus had told them to do. Here's what he said. This is in Luke chapter 24 and verse 49. And Jesus said, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. So these 120 people, they knew that something was going to happen and that it involved receiving power from heaven. So for 10 days... They waited. I wonder what would happen to us today if I said, let's come back to church tonight and God's going to do something, but we need to wait here until he does it. I wonder how many days y'all wait with me. They waited 10 days. Now we know a little bit of what they were doing during those 10 days, obviously, we know that they were praying because the Bible says they prayed prayers of supplication. Now, supplication is one of those Bible words. That's just another word for request. They prayed prayers making requests. They were requesting. Um, and so they were asking God for something. I think they were probably asking for him to send the power that Jesus said that he was going to endure upon them, that he was going to put on them. And as a side note, I want to I want to briefly touch on something. This is from Acts chapter one and verse 14. It says this. These all continued this 120. These all continued in in one accord in prayer and supplication. So they were praying in one accord. That's not a Honda. <laughs> they were praying in one accord. 120 people in one accord. That's like a clown car or something like that, right? <laughs> no, it says they were in one accord. That means they agreed on what they were asking God to do. I just want to tell you something, church. We have an incredible weapon that we can use to get what we need from God, to get the power that we need from God, if we will only agree in one accord to pray for it and ask for it. So those, and I want you to think about this. I was thinking this last week about this, and, and these last 10, these, these 10 days, that 10 days was the last time until the rapture of the entire, that the entire church was in one place asking God to do something. We will not see the entire church, every Christian in the world was in that room that 120, the last time we saw the entire church come together in one place, praying for one thing, was on the day of Pentecost. And we won't see that again until the rapture of the church. And they were in that place asking God to do something. Now here's what I want you to understand from this. Sometimes when we pray, God takes his time answering our prayers. Could have been, could there have been any better conditions?
for God to answer prayer. 120 people. Actually, it probably started off more like 500, but you know, after a while, by the time you get to the 10 days, there's only 120 of them left. But could there have been any better conditions for prayer to be answered than a time when the entire church was together praying for one thing? So the whole church is together praying for exactly the same thing, and it still took 10 days. The Bible never tells us why it took 10 days. We never know. It never says. I wonder what it was like in that upper room. Uh, they had been told there was something new that was coming, and they, they knew life wasn't going to be the same anymore. And as they waited, the hours, the days began to slip by. And I wonder if there was some impatience in the air. Okay, we've, we've prayed as much as we can pray. We've, we've sung every song that we know to sing, and we've repeat, we're like the Assemblies of God, we've repeated it over and over again for 20 minutes, the one song. That's what we do. And they waited day after day, they prayed everything, they prayed every prayer they knew how to pray, they, uh, they sang every song they probably knew how to sing, and I wonder if uh, the excitement of the resurrection turned into boredom as those days went by. But I also wonder if the opposite couldn't have been true. You know, is it possible that the atmosphere of the upper room was alive with that kind of electricity that somebody that we sense when we're waiting for? You know, you know when we know this? Like Christmas, between Thanksgiving and Christmas. I mean, I don't feel it as much anymore, but when I was a little kid, man, so we did Thanksgiving at my grandma's house. And then the day after Thanksgiving, we went to decorate her tree. So that was the whole family decorated grandma's tree because she was too lazy to do it herself. <laughs> uh, it might have had more to do with how old she was. I don't know. But, but I just remember how exciting it was to put up that tree because I knew now Christmas is coming. And I would try to be as good as I could be for that length of time. And I wonder if it might have been like that in the upper room, that they knew something was coming. They knew it was going to be power. They knew it was going to be something that changed their lives. Their lives would never be the same again. And I wonder if they kind of had that anticipation. Shouldn't the kind of anticipation be how we wait on the Holy Spirit? I challenged one of my churches one time. Let's see what would happen if once we were done with church on Wednesday night, we just began as an entire congregation to pray and focus on Sunday morning and what God would do. And guess what? God fulfilled that and the Holy Spirit fell. We had an incredible service. But you know what? It only happened one time. I thought, I thought, the next week they would want to do the same thing. But no, the next week it was right back to same old, same old. You see, well, that's what happens. Sometimes we, it gets old to us. And so, and sometimes tragically we will let ministry or even our involvement in church or maybe even other involvements. How many of you, well, not anymore, I'm not, but how many of you know what it's like to work hour after hour at your job, you know, and you can't concentrate on anything else but do, doing that job. Right now I have a little break from that. Hopefully I'll have a long break from, no, I don't need a long break. I need to go back to work because Gloria's going to kick me out of the house. <laughs> but sometimes we get in this routine to where there's no longer this excitement of what God is. Can do, And even as we wait on him, we need to challenge ourselves to be energized by an excited anticipation of what God is doing. I want to tell you a spiritual truth this morning, church, and I hope you will remember this. You and I have no clue what God can do to us anytime we come together. 
And we should be excited about the fact that we are coming together as a church in one place. Now we're allowed to do that. We can come together in one place. And what God can do is virtually unlimited. And I wonder what would happen if when we leave today, we began saying to ourselves, I don't know what God's going to do next Sunday, but I know he'll do something incredible. I know that he will be there. I wonder what would happen if we lived this entire week in anticipation of coming back together in God's house, anticipating what he could do. The fulfillment of his promises always means something good. Even, even if like those gathered in the upper room, we don't know the details about what is coming. We can be sure, however, that whatever God is sending us will be worth waiting for. So they were waiting and they were praying for something to happen. And it finally did. One translation says this, that when the day of Pentecost was fulfilled, that word fulfilled Men means that God had set the date. Church, you have prayed for your need and you are waiting for God to answer. And I'm telling you today, I want you to hear this. I'm telling you today that God has set the date for your answer to be met. For whatever you're praying for, the answer is on the way. God has put the date on his calendar and whatever you're praying for is on the way. The date has been set. Your prayer will be answered and your need is going to be met. So after waiting for 10 days without warning, there's a sound. It sounds like the wind is blowing. And in my mind, it goes like this. It keeps getting louder and louder and louder until the sound of wind fills the entire house where they were. And just as it gets so that you can hardly stand it anymore because it's so loud, the wind is blowing. Just as all this happening, a fireball appears in the room and immediately divides. And over everyone in the room, there's a flame above their head. Good thing there was no such thing as product for our hair. <laughs> Can you, I want you to think about that, this rushing sound of wind. And then all of a sudden, a fireball comes in the room and it says divided. And everybody, they look around the room, all 120 of them, and every one of them have a little fireball above their head. I have a feeling that would be a memorable service. <laughs> and of course there'd then be the super religious people they go well we didn't have service today there was no fireball <laughs> then when they pray rushing wind fireball dividing over them and then when they start to pray something weird comes out of their mouth <laughs> Now they're, and by the way, they're no longer praying request. Now they're proclaiming, according to the Bible, what they are saying, even though it's in a different language, is proclaiming the works of God. They are each one in a new language sharing the gospel. And that is what happened when the power that Jesus told them to wait for arrived. That's the story of Pentecost. But truthfully, it was a story that had begun 800 years before the day of Pentecost. It's, and it is a story that continues today and will continue until Jesus comes. The story of Pentecost is a story of God sending the Holy Spirit. Now listen, with the world that we live in, and, and I, I, I'm not saying this because I want to upset anybody, but with the world that we live in and with the major shifting that is happening in our culture today, we can no longer believe that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is optional. 
Because I believe every believer needs to be filled with the Holy Spirit. See, see, for too long, we've talked about the Holy Spirit as, well, you get saved, and that's good because then you're on your way to heaven. And then if you want to, you can have this really cool add-on. It's like buying a car. <laughs> you know, if you really want to, you can have automatic transmission instead of standard. Or if you want to, you can have air conditioning in your car. And so we, we kind of have decided that the Holy Spirit is just kind of this add-on luxury item that we can have. Can I just tell you something? That when you're driving and it's 100 degrees outside, air conditioning is not a luxury at all. And it's the same way with the world that we're living in today. We're living in a world where we have to come to the understanding that having the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives is no longer a luxury add-on. It is something that is necessary because of the world that we live in. We need every advantage that we can get in order to maintain and preserve our salvation. Now, church, I know that might, there might be some that are uncomfortable, but I have to tell you this, and this is a truth. We are at war. Yes. We are. Can you look at just what's happened in our nation in the last few days and understand that we are not in the midst of a spiritual battle? There's a spiritual climate change, like how I worked that in. <laughs> there is a spiritual climate change occurring today that is doing everything it can to steal your salvation, to beat you down, to discourage you in your Christian walk, to make you think that you're all alone, to persuade you that, number one, the church is dying. That the word of God is no longer outdated and no longer valid. And to content, convince you to give up and walk away. And here's how it works. First from your prayer. Then from the Bible. And then from the church. And ultimately from the faith. And you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit to give you the strength to withstand what the enemy is trying to do to you. Let me take you to Isaiah 59. We're going to read the last part of that verse. Isaiah 59 and 19 says, when the enemy comes in like a flood, what's the next part? The spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. Hey, don't you, don't you like the idea that it says when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. We know who the enemy is. You, you, can, you can blame all this stuff that is happening right now you, you can blame that on politics. You can blame it on the president. You can blame it on the governors. You can blame it on a race of people. You can blame it on Antifa. But the fact of the matter is, this is the devil at work. This is the enemy at work. What causes people to react the way they are is because the enemy is working in them. When you're overwhelmed with life and when you're being beaten down by the world and the circumstances of your life, it is the Holy Spirit that will come to you and hold back all those things that are trying to come against you. You need the Holy Spirit at work. You need the power of the Holy Spirit working in you. You need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But the story of Pentecost is also a story of God keeping his promises. You see, when the day of Pentecost had come and the people began to hear different languages spoken by these 120, the Bible says that the crowd had gathered. And they asked this question. What does all this mean? What are you guys doing? Some people thought they were drunk. I don't know if that's a good sign when people come out of church and everybody's asking if they're drunk. <laughs> You know, maybe too much communion or something, I don't know. But It says they ask this question, what does all this stuff, what's all this mean? So Peter stands up and he gives an explanation and he begins with the book of Joel that was written 800 years before this day. Let me read, let me read to you seven verses from this. It's Acts chapter two and verse 14. And it says, but Peter standing up with the 11 
raised his voice and said to them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last day, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven and above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and a vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to dark and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now I want to show you something. I'm going to skip down a few verses. Let's skip down to verse 38. So it's, it's Acts chapter 2, verse 38. And listen to what Peter says, because I want to show you something from this passage that is really cool for us today. He says, Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now listen to this next part. For the promise is to you and to all your children and to all who are far off. You know who all who are far off is? 2,000 years later, we are far off. And as many as the Lord our God will call. So let me just show you this and then, and then we're going to pray. So I spent some time recently reading a book on Joel because I, I'd like to do a Bible study on Wednesday nights on the book of Joel. The book of Joel is a really hard book at least for me to understand. So I found this book and it was written in 1909. I like reading books from the early day of Pentecost. So I found this book written in 1909. Um, and, and no, I was not alive then. <laughs> and the writer, when he's writing about this promise from God that it's gonna pour off, that it's gonna, God's gonna pour out, his spirit said, that God's going to pour out his spirit. The writer said this. He said, that promise has never been fulfilled. Then that when Peter preaches on the day of Pentecost, Peter didn't say that prophecy was fulfilled. This is what the prophet spoke of. And this is what Joel wrote about. He basically says that Joel 2 was fulfilled because it had to happen after the destruction in the res restoration of the nation of Israel. Think about this. Go back and read that passage I just read to you. Joel says, in Joel chapter 2, it says, this pouring out is going to be fulfilled after the destruction of Israel and the res restoration of the nation of Israel. See, so the day of Pentecost was just a part of that fulfillment, but the fullness of that fulfillment 1948. In 70 AD, Israel was destroyed. By the way, I like this. In 1909, when the book I was reading was being written, one of the greatest outpourings of the Spirit was occurring in America. It was the Azusa Street Revival was happening in Los Angeles, California. From that revival came the Assemblies of God, which this church is a part of. And according to this author, for the promise of Joel to be fulfilled, Israel had to be destroyed and then restored. And of course, in 1909, Israel had been destroyed, but had not yet been restored. So in 1901, God began pouring out his spirit. I want you to think about this. He began pouring out a spirit in 1901 on our nation and the Pentecostal church is birthed. And then what happens in 1948? Israel is restored as a nation. So he began pouring out in 1901, and I submit to you today, he is still pouring out. Amen. All these years later, 100, what, 119 years later, the pouring is still happening. Amen. So when Peter says in Acts chapter 2, for the promises to you and your children and all who are far off, that's us. Church, we need to understand 
We, we are this church, you and I who are alive, we are the generation that is living in the actual fulfillment of Joel chapter 2. I should have heard a lot of amens on that. Because amen. that's for us. Yes. We're living in the time when God is pouring out his spirit. And I believe that Israel having been restored is never going to be destroyed again. And for the last 72 years, the nation of Israel and the Pentecostal church for the first time have been in existence together. And God keeps his promises. If you're following Jesus, there are 7,000 promises that God made in the Bible. 7,000. And I think it's safe to say that a lot of them apply to us. And God will keep every one of them. You know what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 20? For all the promises of God in him are yes and in him amen. In other words, so be it. To the glory of God through us. Listen, church, I'm guessing that many promises and with the Bible saying that God is going to say yes to each one of them with the confirmation of the amen, the so be it, everything you need, every prayer request that you have ever made can be answered, get this, with a yes. Because God has promised it to you. There are promises for healing. There are promises for spiritual renewal. There are promises for the healing of broken relationships, for the restoration of finances, for whatever calling God has placed upon you. Whatever you are praying for, there is a promise from God that he will meet it. And just like the promise of Pentecost, there is a planned date that you will receive your answer. I want you to acknowledge right now, there is a planned date that I will receive my promise from God. If you're sick today and you need healing in your body, God has already set the date for you to receive your healing. If you need a financial miracle in your life, God has already set the date for that need to be met. If there is a broken relationship in your life, God has set the date for that restoration. Keep praying because I promise you, church, the answer is on the way. Can you say amen to that this morning? Father, we thank you for the promise of Pentecost. We thank you for the promise that you've been pouring out on us for, as a nation, for 119 years. We thank you that we are the generation living in the fulfillment of that promise this morning. And I ask right now that whatever needs that people in our congregation are praying for, that you would meet that need. And we thank you, God, because we know that you are a God who, if we pray according to your will, the answer will be met and the answer will be yes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to do this today. I can't anoint you with oil because of the restrictions. Hopefully in a few weeks. I lost my voice. Was I preaching hard today? Was I? No. I need to calm down. I'll tell you this. If you were following on Facebook, this wasn't the message I planned to preach today. I don't think God just changes things because he had a whim. I think he changes things because he knows there's something that needs to happen. I can't anoint you with oil because I'm not allowed to touch you. <laughs> but we can do this. We can pray. And God can overcome whatever barrier there has to. Yeah, we could dump, I could squirt it. Can you imagine I had stand up there with a super soaker and a... <laughs> who needs who needs prayer today? You raise your hand. I'll get you. But we can pray. And we know that God, the greatest thing from this message that I saw was that God has made 7,000 promises. How, much, how many of you know that no matter what you ask for, they're probably somewhere in those 7,000? Because I can't even think up 7,000. 
I can't even imagine what 7,000, that's an incredible number. I wish I had done the math. If you did 7,000 promises and he met one every day, how many years would it take for him to do that? Almost 20 years, if I'm doing my math right. Close to 20 years if he met a promise every single day. Is that an incredible number? I guarantee you that unless you're like me and you're asking for a Corvette, that promise probably isn't in the 7,000. <laughs> but I guarantee that most of what you're asking God for is what you really, really need. I'll guarantee you the promises that God has made that promise and that the Bible says he's going to say yes. See, when, when I say, according to the Bible, when I say God is going to say yes to your promise, you should say Amen. The so be it. So be it. We can count on it today. So what I want to do before we close out in prayer is on this Pentecost Sunday when we would know God can do anything. If you have a need, why don't you why don't you just stand?